and welcome to another brand new episode of the Deep Cut here on the Outlaw Nation. I am the Outlaw, John Roca, and I am so excited to be joined by someone who I've been following for quite some time, whose career I've loved and watched and enjoyed. She's an actress, an author, a blogger, a recent podcast host, and even more recent director. And she's here to talk about her new film, amongst other things. It's called Notorious Nick, and she plays the mom of Notorious Nick in this movie. And I'm excited to welcome her to the show to have a fun little conversation about her life and about this movie, the great Elizabeth Rome. How are you, Elizabeth? So good and so happy to meet you as well. What an intro. (laughs) Thank you. You deserve it. I've been been enjoying your career for such a long time, and uh, I'm a massive fan. Uh, right off the back, I'll just say I'm a massive Law & Order fan, and one of the things I did during the pandemic was to go back and watch a, like almost multiple seasons on Peacock, and I had not seen a number of the – I had not seen them in a while, a number of your seasons. It was great to go back and get reacquainted once again with the uh, stylings of uh, Ser- Serena Sutherland, and, uh, you know, it's so funny because I know – Sometimes the character has taken some dings over the years, but you are tied with the longest running uh, assistant district attorney ever on the show. And I think a lot of the things you stood for and fought for in the show in 2021, ironically, would make your character like a hero. It's so fantastic to I mean, it's so interesting now to go back and look at it through the 2021 eyes and see how in 2005 or 2001, 2004, like all the stuff you were pushing for is stuff that people are pushing for now. No, it's really funny you say that because it's true. Back when I started, the the Law and Order ADA wore gray suits that looked uh, like a Mormon sheath. They were <laughs> bare. You didn't see the hips. You didn't see the. There was yes. no lipstick. There was, you know, there were there were no bangs or, you know. And I had the privilege of going to a very um, awakened college. I went to Sarah Lawrence. Yes. And we studied gender and we studied feminism and all of that and. So my approach to Serena Sutherland was from that perspective of the sort of almost like you said, the post Me Too movement, which was, um, you know, she can be brilliant and feminine and be in a leadership role and sexy. And, you know, she can be bright and light and and yet be an authoritative figure. Yeah. But you're right. I did get a little pushback because I was, you know, the blonde and I had the bangs and I wanted I wanted the lipstick and I wanted the Ralph Lauren, the Lauren suit that like hugged my curves. and. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, but I guess I had the confidence to know that, you know, brilliant women, um, did not need to be, uh, to emulate men in any way, shape or form. Right. Um, so you're right. That's a really great, um, a judgment. No, it's true. And I, and I, and as I think about Notorious Snake, which is the movie you are here to promote and talk about, it's this idea of people making judgments right off the bat based on appearance and not wanting to go surface deep, not wanting to give a chance to a character or to a person in life. And so talk to me, uh, this, this is very prevalent throughout this movie. I got a chance to watch it this morning. So it is fresh in my mind. Talk to me about what attracted you to this role, what attracted you to the story. And we'll get into other things that you do as well that might've been tied into this story that might've brought you onto the project, but how did this all come about and what, what drew you to it? Well, first of all, I really appreciate that. Um, I am an ambassador for Special Olympics um, yes. as of this month, but um, I think I've spent my whole life being um, deeply concerned with inclusion, justice, equality, diversity, um, and also just the winning spirit, the, the 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 human spirit, and our you know the deep reservoir that we have inside of us that mm-hmm. that we dig into every morning to step back and lean back into our lives. Um, you know, with an enthusiasm and a passion towards living our best lives. And I had never read a story. This is based on a true story, Nick Newell's life. Achievements as a wrestler that was more inspiring for everybody. You know, can you imagine the circumstances of, you know, not having your father figure, having a single mom who's really struggling to take care of you, you know, being born without one of your arms, wanting to be like everybody else, wanting to be included, um, you know, stories of inclusion right now are m- very much a hot topic. You know, yeah. when you talk to somebody even who is struggling with gender dysmorphia, there's no, there's no, um, there's no clearer way to state what that type of a person is feeling. They just want to be normal. They just yeah. want to be included from that that perspective. And to suffer from that has been um, 
something that I've cared very deeply about probably my whole life. And so Notorious Nick was really an opportunity for me to explore that topic because he does become a champion mm. and he's inspiring for all of us because whatever fears we each have inside of us that keep us small, that keep us in a box, that keep us isolated or, or, or you know, this story is a story of bravery and, you know, thankfully he also did have a great mom who was mm -hmm. um, encouraging to him that I play and he had a great coach that was also encouraging to him. Um, and, I, and then Barry Levin, Levingston and Kevin Pollack also, you know, being incredible characters in the movie. He did, he did become very lucky that he had some tentpole relationships mm -hmm. that encouraged him to uh, be fearless and, you know, break through societal boundaries. Yeah, you discover that in life if you come, you know, I, I've had to struggle in my own life to achieve the things that I've achieved. I understand how important it is to have those tentpole people in your life. You know, sometimes that set makes the difference between you getting to that next level or succeeding to a certain degree because someone is there as a great sounding board or someone is there who's got contacts or someone is there who believes in you at a critical moment when you're not sure if you can keep going. And the thing that's incredible about this movie is Nick has a num Nick Newell has a number of moments where he can quit. Where in and there is not not a spoiler, not to give too much away, but there is a moment where he does early on in the movie, and then you see this uh, this hardened interior and exterior start to develop throughout the movie. So much so that even the the mom, which is the character you play, questions it in certain moments before she has her own uh, Serena Sutherland moment there in front of the commission. But like you have that. To, so it's every character has a journey in this movie. And sometimes you don't see that in these smaller films. And it's great to see that that is important in all the characters and especially the character you play. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last thing you want to do as a parent is ever see your child be harmed mm -hmm. or hurt. But sometimes we can be the very adversity that our child is trying to overcome because we want to keep them small and safe. And I do think that my character in Notorious Nick and really true to Nick Newell's mom and true story that this movie is based on. Um, and please, anyone who's listening, go learn more about Nick Newell. And yeah. this is a living, breathing human being that achieved these things that Cody Christian is such a movie star. He really portrayed with all his heart and soul. Um, but these are people who, you know, are supportive of this movie because, you know, the film itself really, you know, does justice to their true life. Mm -hmm. And. And yes, I think in spite of her own fears of her child's safety and well-being, she decided to be his greatest advocate and 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 go for that gold on behalf of him. And that and knowing that he would be hurt and knowing he might be ridiculed and knowing that there might be those people or there would be those people out there continuously that would mock him yeah. or, or or want to um, cause him harm. But because in his heart this was his greatest self, she was going to advocate for him to be seen and heard and to be included. Did you have conversations with uh, Stacy Newell? Is she still with us? Did you have and did you have any conversations with Nick as well? No, I didn't. But I <laughs> I had done a lot of research on them and had read a lot of articles and seen a lot of videos, and so I you know I felt inspired by the true woman. I I had not gone off on you know my own creative jag. Mm. I, there was a lot of information on her. So you were able to use that, just build the character yeah. out of that and develop uh, yeah. through the script as well. How much input did you have uh, on the script? Because it's funny. You know, when I, as I mentioned, when I look back on Serena now, there's so much of that, of her points of views that seem similar to your own points of views. And I was wondering if you have been kind of uh, behind the scenes, a com having conversations with writers, having conversations with people when you get involved in these projects, especially now as you're, um, you know, obviously you've grown into your power as an actress and as a force in the in the world. Do you feel like, okay, there are certain things I really want to hit, I want to highlight, or are you more in service of the piece as it comes to you? No, I think I'm not just in service of the piece. There, I don't want to do things that don't have a purpose. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm... Not that I won't do a great horror movie as an actor or, I mean, a great comedy that, you know, but I mean, old, oh. my, my purpose is to, I feel, bring people together. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of why I created my company, The Respect Project as well, which intentionally invites people into conversation from diverse points of view and asks them to respectfully listen and to share 
so that we have a more united and less divided world because all of these various platforms that we counted on so much to unite us, yeah. social media and so forth, they really divided us. Yeah. And, and the world is extremely divided right now. And so I invite people into respectful conversations to talk about essential topics of the time that might get people really hot and bothered. But in these respectful conversations, we agree to disagree and just to listen and to hopefully come out recognizing that we're more alike than different. Yeah. So that 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 message of inclusion is really important to me, as yeah. well as you know joining this Special Olympics now as an ambassador, because I have found with people with intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities like Nick Newell, mm -hmm. um, that they, are more inspiring than just about anybody else because they have all of this adversity to get over, much more than we can even imagine. And yet we have our own. And so therefore we are connected and we are alike, and we can look to those athletes for inspiration because they are having to overcome things we can't even imagine. And we can apply that to our lives and we can yeah. apply the principles of special olympics or the or the you know the obstacles that nick newell overcame um and 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 sort of embrace a world and, and build a world and be inspired by a world that is based on the jedi mm -hmm. principles justice equality diversity and inclusion <laughs> nice nice elizabeth rome um were you an mma fan are you a sports fan? Tell the truth here. What's your experience to MMA and experience with sports? Are you obsessed with it quietly or was this kind of a new experience for you going into MMA stuff? Well, it's really funny because um, <laughs> the Shriver family, are they founded Special Olympics and they right. are in sports. And here I'm doing Notorious Nick. And it's interesting because right now these things are going hand in hand for me. And I'm not <laughs> that into sports. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'm Wait, Sarah Lawrence didn't have a football team or a field hockey team? Come on. <laughs> Sarah Lawrence, no, Sarah Lawrence was all about like nerdy, nerdy, uh, nerdy, not losers, but I mean, you know, people yeah. who had no friends, like <laughs> running around, like with the book of Nietzsche under their arm. That's right. Um, yeah, no, no, no sports, uh, more like artistic class. <laughs> so, but, but ironically, sports is, an, a, you know, the sports arena, the sports world is a way in which we celebrate each other. Yes. And once we sort of get through uh, the, the discomfort or the or the intensity of of these kinds of conversations like the respect project is hosting um or a film that really goes into the depth of somebody like Nick, Nick Newell overcoming these obstacles what we're really wanting is to celebrate life in each other and to celebrate our differences as opposed to be divided by our differences yeah. so i do think when it comes to sports sports is an opportunity to celebrate to fight to be competitive to be alive and to, you know, and to come out hopefully like vindicated and a champion like people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my girlfriend and I, this is where we have our divide because she is not a person in sports. She's more <laughs> of a Sarah Lawrence person, very nerdy into books, very much talking about philosophy and all of that. But I love sports like crazy. And uh, I can get into those discussions about Nietzsche and all of that. But it's but I but I try to explain to her and I try to explain to a lot of people because I host a sports show on this on this channel as well is that sports is a reflection of society. And in many cases, sports is where we saw the example of inclusion. Uh, for example, Jackie Robinson, when you see those right. kinds of things start to happen. Right. Uh, in 1968, was it Tommy Smith? And when they raised the, the hand, the black hand like that was to make people aware of what was happening in our society and the social issues going on. So a lot of times sports kind of in some weird way leads the way or highlights this issue for more of the mainstream pop culture to be aware of. So in that way, sports, I think, is, it serves a very strong purpose in our society. Absolutely. And for some strange reason, the you know, some actors get compared to other actors and, yeah. and are told, oh, you remind me of so-and-so, but I have been told that I remind people of Wander Bossy. So. <laughs> So that yes, and 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 Lindsey Vaughn. So first, I better get into sports because <laughs> my doppelgangers are some some of the best athletes uh, <laughs> in, the, in the United States. Well, I mean, I think that's good company because they they both succeed at what they're doing, just as you've succeeded at what you're doing. So this is good company to be in, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, I do I do love what you guys uh, are doing over there at Respect Project. It's a really powerful group of people with uh, incredible reach uh, across the world, not just uh, obviously in America, but across the world. Uh, you know, I love the the message here. We believe that in order to live a peaceful and open-minded society, there's a need to hear and share eclectic narratives, ideas, thoughts, and inspiration 
Um, about a year, a little over a year ago, I was let go from the uh, site I was working on because some of the stuff wasn't working. They had to cut staff. And I started my own channel, which is what this is. And I wanted it to be a channel of inclusion. So I've worked really hard to have people of color be part of this, to have women be part of this, women of color be part of this. It's so important for me. What, uh, because as a, as a Latino, it's important for me to show that there is more, there are more voices, even in the film critic community, even in the TV reviewing community. Tell me what drives you? I mean, you know, you're a white, uh, beautiful, intelligent woman. What drives you to make sure all these voices are involved? Because you honestly didn't have to. So what drives you to make sure these, uh, these voices are heard in our society? Was there an early experience or has it always been something inside you? I guess? No, I think it's always been inside of me. My okay. mom was an activist and a hippie and a very awakened person. And wow. she always approached life like, you know, not only do you have to find a purpose, but you have to fight for other people. Hmm. And I guess the description you said of me is true. I can cross the divides. Hmm. I'm a border crosser in a sense, and it's a privilege. Um, I did not, I have not had to suffer um, exclusion. Um, if I'm stopped by a police officer, I don't have to fear for my life. Um, I am represented and I, and therefore, you know, I, I should have a loud voice. I shouldn't stand by the sidelines and then, or say I'm going shoulder to shoulder with all my, my, you know, friends who have suffered um, and, and say nothing. And I'm, and I'm not an activist. I'm, I'm not a very political person person and the respect project is switzerland it's not a political platform right. um and it's not meant to be divisive in any way but i do think that in order to heal um and to end our personal suffering um we have to unite and in order to unite we have to accept our differences we do not have to just tolerate them we have to understand them yeah. and, and i don't believe in the melting pot I don't think we should all be the same. I, I shouldn't mm. feel badly because of my background or the way that I look or, but knowing factually what my brothers and sisters and friends and friends with ID or, or physical disabilities mm. or gender issues or gender, you know, dysmorphia or whatever, any topic of any kind or, yeah. or political um, conflicts, what have you, if you can bring people together and say for an hour, for a moment, let's yeah. listen to each other we may walk away more united than divided, but we're not going to walk away uh, as cookie cutters of each other. Yeah. You know, when I joined Special Olympics, it's not because I have a, a sibling or an aunt or an uncle with ID, but I do, I do believe there's a story, a universal story of inclusion that yeah. Special Olympics can share with the world. And right now the world is very divided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's a great point. It is very divided. People seem very entrenched in their point of view versus you know wanting to be able to have conversations with the other side it, having conversations sometimes it seems like people take it as you're implicitly accepting their point of view as valid or, or yeah. correct and i think that's where people are having the divide here because i remember a time when we could have you know heated arguments or heated discussions about different points of views and then you walk away and have a beer or walk away and go watch the latest movie with your friends like it, you used to be able to do that but there seems the stakes at least in our minds, and that's as it's been portrayed by the media, the stakes seem to have increased in terms of importance. It seems to almost be life and death for a large uh, a majority within those groups who are becoming the loudest uh, members of those groups to try to push it in a certain direction. And I don't see a way of coming together if those forces win on each side. And so I like what you're saying, and I really respect and appreciate what you're saying. The discussion has to be had. It doesn't mean you have to agree, but have the discussion so you can understand all the sides of what's happening in, in our world, in our country, in our cities, in our towns, you know? Right. So, again, you know, back to Notorious Nick, I mean, bringing people together mm -hmm. that absolutely are different on purpose. Yeah. And that's the Respect Project. And Notorious Nick, again, is highlights a human being that for all intents and purposes is an outsider right? and wants to be accepted and wants to fight like a regular fighter and wants to be seen and represented and heard. And just because of his, his physical disability is excluded. Right. And when we are excluded, we get angry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think this is a great story of 
um, a community that surrounds him, that supports him and yeah. help, helps him to be heard and seen and to have a, a place in the fight yeah. and, 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 there, and then win. Um, and, and really, I do think it is a now topic. I think for anybody that has been touched by any of these topics we're getting into, um, Jedi principles, justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion is at the heartbeat of Notorious Nick. And, and he wins. Yeah. And, and we do all want those inspiring stories of winning because we've been through a very uh, weary time and yeah. we do need stories of inspiration. So this is a great story about an athlete who, you know, much like any other athlete who becomes a champion, it's a great inspiring story for all of us, whether we have um, any connection at all whatsoever to somebody with a physical disability or intellectual yeah. disability. But um, it's tough to be human. And this story <laughs> is, um, is about the indomitable human spirit. Yeah. I mean, you look at his physical disabilities, but as you said earlier, a lot of us sometimes have mental disabilities or emotional disabilities that can mirror a physical disability, whether it's trauma or experience from childhood with parents or any anything. And so there is a, an inspiration to be found in this story with Nick Newell. What what did you find to be the most challenging for you be, uh, being involved in this movie? Or was, or was this you know, like pretty much in your wheelhouse and you knew what you were doing when you walked in? No, I, I think, first of all, Cody Christian, all I have to say is like, oh, yeah repeat his name five times like Cody <laughs> Christian Cody he is like literally a superstar He's and stellar and I really felt then and we made this movie a while ago when we locked arms as mother and son I, mm -hmm. I he had that spirit of deep commitment to the role as if you know it was the only and most important thing to him and I had the same commitment and so did the other actors and so I think when you've got, you know, producers and actors and all of the artists that make a movie, the cinema family that comes together to make something all committed to do it to their best of their ability, you know, you, you can sometimes get lucky and catch lightning in a bottle. And I think Notorious Nick does that. What we've seen since then, many years ago, since, since we made this movie is, you know, because sometimes it happens like that with independent film, yeah. is Cody has really become a name star. And this is this type of role is very deserving for an actor with his talent. And I'm yeah. excited for him. I hope that everybody goes out and sees it. Because if you don't know him or if you already love him, this is a, a performance that's a tour de force for him, especially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it comes out August 6th. I think it's available now on Apple TV and on demand. So you should definitely watch it. But yes, Cody Christian. That's a name now we've heard, you know, Teen Wolf, he really kind of established himself in that and then jumping into numerous other projects. This guy is tailor made right now to be in a superhero movie to uh, just to really blow up his career and do whatever. But, um, I, you know, but I've read some some quotes from uh, Elizabeth Roman. She has said, like, uh, yeah, she wouldn't turn down being in a superhero movie. She likes working out. She likes staying in shape. She, it's it's an, a I wouldn't say an obsession, but it's a drive within her from what I've seen. And I break because I follow you on social media. So, uh, you know, is this a possibility for you in your mind? Have there been uh, have you had your agents or managers kind of, uh, you know, kind of bang on that door a little bit to get you into any of these worlds? Do, do you do you have it? Do you have an interest in it? I guess is what Absolutely. I'm asking. Absolutely. I, th yeah. I think that, again, like a movie like this that inspires us, super superhero movies inspire us as well. And, yeah. you know, whether I get to act in one or direct one, ah. um, I'm, I'm happy to start to get into the DC world. I would love it. Um, and my second film comes out in October, October 16th. It's um, another story uh, that's very heartfelt. And, um, and then I have some pretty big news. I believe I'll soon let everybody know that I'll be directing something in the new year. So yes, it would be amazing if my fourth movie was um, with, a, with DC in the, super, in the superhero world, or I'd be happy to put on a, a, a onesie and have some superpowers <laughs> myself. Hell yeah. Did you have a superhero that you enjoyed when you were growing up as a, as a young kid, or was it all Nietzsche from birth? Like, what was no, it? What no, was no, no. There's not a girl in the world that didn't love Wonder Woman. Ah, okay. Fair. Patty Jenkins. I'm a huge fan, fan of Patty Jenkins from top to bottom, and uh, Wonder Woman for sure was a big inspiration. But I think I would have been more like a fire breather and like and burnt things down to like make way for, for myself. <laughs> Like a fire starter. I like that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. 
Um, you know, as we uh, kind of round the corner here on on uh, Notorious Nick, what do you take away? Now, I know you said it's been a few years, so it's been obviously it's been in the can, and now it's finally coming out. Um, what do you take away now when you look back on that experience? You know, I, I was an actor for a little while, for about 15 years. I know, like, every project, when you look back on it, uh, if it's been a good experience, you take something from it. Uh, what do you now, when you hear about it, when you think about it, when you're doing the press tour as you're doing now for it, what, do you, what comes up for you the most when you think about this movie? I really loved this film when it was offered to me. I'm so proud to be in this film and that Lionsgate uh, mm. purchased it. And I guess my only message is, is do the things you love. They're worth waiting for because we made this years ago and I'd been waiting every year, every six months. I'd say, when is Notorious Nick coming out? I mean, <laughs> it was just such an important film to me. So, you know, again, do the things you love, stand behind the things you believe in fight the good fight. Um, and I guess when it comes to independent filmmaking, you know, uh, be patient. Sometimes the best films take a long time to come out, but Notorious Nick is out now. I hope everybody goes out and sees it and supports this really important film, this important message. Um, and I hope that we can all celebrate life together a whole lot more by watching a film like this. Yeah. Mom, Mom, Mama Stacy says that in the movie. Mama Stacy says that to young Nick when he is sitting there and he's not sure and he wants to quit. Uh, she's like, oh, no, no, you're not going to quit. The best things you got to you got to fight for the things that you want in life and, and right. make you happy. And, and as, <laughs> right. as the son of a nurse, I, I felt that connection, too, in that experience that you guys were having throughout the film. Uh, I, I want to move on. Let's move on to the directing thing. You mentioned that you just you had a, a film with uh, Judd Nelson and Jolie Fisher, Girl in a Basement, Girl in the Basement, I think is what it's called. And now it's, it's switched at birth. Is that the next one that you've got? Yeah, Switched Before Birth comes Birthful. out October 16th, I believe. And it was it's with Justina Machado, uh, yeah. Yancy Arias, um, mm -hmm. and Skylar Samuels, and Bo Yokely, and a myriad of other amazing actors. And again, it's, it's sort of um, a topical piece. It's about uh, fertility issues and mm -hmm. so on. But it's a, it's, a, it's a great film. It has a lot of drama, a lot of comedy, a lot of heart. Um, and I'm really excited for everybody to see it. What, why the turn? What have you, have you come to this place where you feel more confident, more strong now to step behind the camera or has this been building for you for quite some time? And finally the, uh, the opportunity presented itself with the first lifetime movie. Now I think switch for fourth is also a lifetime movie as well. Is that yeah. correct? So yeah. what, what, what is it that finally turned the corner for you as an artist that it was time to step behind the camera? Tanya Lopez, who runs oh. uh, Lifetime Movies. I mean, the broader focus program, the Me Too movement, the yeah. everything, you know, the everything movement, the, the world in which I lived when I was in my 20s, where I never saw a female director like me looking back at me, encouraging me to do it, give more or, you know, dig deeper in my work to then seeing more women like me represented, to seeing my, you know, to seeing ourselves represented, Yeah. right? whether like you said, like you're Latin, seeing yourself represented. Oh, yeah. we want, if we don't see ourselves represented, we don't think we have a place in that story. And as uh, the female voice has gotten stronger, I've always wanted to direct. Mm. As a storyteller, I've not, I've not oh. always just wanted to be the portrayer of the action of the story. Right. I've always wanted to tell the story myself. But I didn't see that reflected back to me. And as time um, moved on, I did. And then I met incredible women, a woman named Tanya Lopez, who mm -hmm. said, OK, I'm going to give you your first film. Then she gave me Girl in the Basement during COVID. And then she gave me my second movie, Switched Before Birth. Mm -hmm. And and now you know I'm off and continuing to pursue directing. But I, I also love acting and intend to be acting yeah. in pretty much everything that I'm developing outside of Switch Before Birth, which I'm not in. But there's right. a role for me in the things that I'm working on. And, and sometimes you have to create your own work. You got to yep. create your own magic, like you no, know, like like Nick Newell said. You got to create <laughs> your own your own opportunity. And um, yeah. being an actor is challenging. So. I think it's also great to be empowered as a director to create acting opportunities as well for myself, but yeah. definitely um, still committed to acting and absolutely as a veteran now uh, actor, I think directing is a great opportunity for me to step back and, and share with my actors, my perspective and, yeah. and support them. So I love actors. So without actors, there's no story, there's no film. And I think as a filmmaker, I'm all, all 
about only about the actors and the performances. Yeah. I mean, following on Instagram, as I have over the last year and a half, I think once we started watching, I was like, well, okay, I got to follow her and see what's going on. I've seen the joy in the pictures that you've taken on sets uh, that you've been directing and all of that. Yeah. Like the real joy you have, masks or no masks, you have a lot of joy taking the pictures and it seems like you're just so happy doing it. Have you discovered a new creative life in, in, in directing here? You know, you're talking about multiple projects you've got in the can now is there is this filling a hole inside you that you'd had for a while but you said but like are you surprised by how much it's enriching your creative life yeah i mean look if i had to choose between the two right now i would i would probably choose directing but i don't right. have to choose right, and, right. <clears throat> but i would say that this year i'm pretty committed to directing and um my dance card is a director is getting pretty filled up and a, a lot by things that i've developed so that's exciting and yes i think after 25 years of acting and and and, and scratching that itch it's nice to sit back quietly by the monitor and watch everybody else excel at what they do and sort of hold that flame you know of the story um, and it is, it's very fulfilling. And, it, and I think in a way surprising Yeah. because, you know, you try something new in your life, you think it might be right for you. I know a lot of actors who've directed one movie and said, that's not for me. Right. Yes. But for me, it's for me. Yeah. <laughs> it is definitely for me. I love it. And I, and I would expect that this will be a big part of my life for many years to come. Are you very hands-on? Do you do you get involved in the casting process? Or are you about finding new talent? Do you remembering what it was like for you to try to break through? Do you go into the sessions sometimes and want to you know kind of find people that you want to elevate and bring up and lift up uh, when you're going through this process? Oh, without a doubt, it's you know interesting as an actor to get into the casting process and hear what the studio's needs are. <laughs> I'm sure. Nationally or so forth. <laughs> for every 50 jobs I auditioned for, I only would get one. Mm. <clears throat> and I really feel strongly that unless we give other people opportunities, we won't get Jennifer Lore and sort of the next, you know, right. Liam Hemsworth or whomever you love. So mm -hmm. I think that um, fighting for a new talent or talent that has done a few things, but they're not a big family name. That's yeah. really very satisfying for me as an actor. Absolutely. Yeah. I got to ask you about something and you feel free not to answer it, but I got to ask you about this. Uh -oh. uh I've, I've read that you are a cousin of Hulk Hogan. Is this true? <laughs> is this true? Because look, I know I he's know, taking, you want to know what, you want to know what is so crazy Yeah. in 25 years of working, no one has ever asked me what. And the answer is, is I, we are cousins and wow. he, I don't even think he knows it. What? Wait, what? Hulk yeah. Hogan doesn't know that you're his cousin? What? No, you're breaking what? world news right now. What? Yeah, that is crazy that you just asked me that. First of all, he and my mom are first cousins. Okay. But he was so famous in my childhood. Like, I really only met him once or twice. And I just, when I pursued acting, I sent him a letter and a, and a headshot of mine and was like, I want to be an actor. And I never heard back from him and I never reached out since. What? He has no idea. I don't think he knows that we, we're we, relatives. We got to make this happen. He, his life story <laughs> is about to be a movie with Chris Hemsworth, for God's sakes. There's got that we've got to get you. There's got to be a way to make this. I'm so shocked. No one has asked you about this. I mean, I'm from I the generation that he. For God's sakes, I should direct it. Yes. That too, that too. Uh, yeah, I'm from the time, you know, I'm from the generation that he influenced with his three demandments. I mean, did you, did you watch it growing up? Because there's an, there's an element of this in the movie in Notorious Nick as well, between the two kids talking about it, you know, the, the weird names, the bear or whatever his name is in the movie. But like you had all these crazy names in the eighties, tugboat, earthquake. I mean, there was just the macho man, you know, there's all that kind of stuff. Were you into any of that at all, knowing that uh, Hulk Hogan was your was your first was your cousin? I mean, not not really, but I did go to one of his fights. Oh! And at the end of his fight, he gave me his blood spattered boots, and I brought <laughs> I brought them to fifth grade the next day, and I was like, "I'm cousins with Hulk Hogan. Look at these boot boots, these huge boots with blood spattered." On them. <laughs> but it was more a story versus like. I was so influenced by the fighters, right, you know, right, right. but yes. <laughs> well, I mean, nowadays, 
It could be interesting because you talk about Ronda Rousey. She has gotten into the WWE now. Women's wrestling has become a very huge part and a selling point of professional wrestling, no matter what federation you're in. So, I mean, I'm sure at some point they're going to want to shoot the Ronda Rousey story. And it seems tailor made for Elizabeth Rome to tell this story and direct it, it seems like. Okay. You're from your lips. All right. We got to obviously get on the phone with my, my manager immediately after this podcast, we have some business to talk about. Plus you, you broke world news. Nobody has ever done this to me before. I can't believe that. I host a pro wrestling show on the channel as well. And I'm shocked that no one has ever asked you about this. It's the first, one of the first facts that stood out to me. And I was like, ah, I don't know, probably everyone's asked her about this, but I'll put it no. out there and see what she feels. Listen, about I, I wow. fully expect to have like a hand delivered invitation come to my house next this week by, by Terry Bolea asking yes. me to come over for lunch, say hello, cousin. <laughs> Listen here, cousin. Um, <laughs> the other thing I want to ask you about, you've gotten in, I mean, we got about 10 minutes left. You've gotten into podcasting. I, you know, I, I do, I've been doing podcasts for about five or six years. It's crazy to see, um, what, um, podcasts, uh, celebrities or actors or, or people of note get uh, start or uh, begin. And this one that you've begun with Eric Roberts, it's an interesting combination first with Eric Roberts, one of the greatest and most unusual actors ever. You must have been so excited to work with him on this project. How did this come about for you uh, with this uh, with this killers podcast? Well, I've always been interested in the criminal mind, obviously having mm -hmm. been in law and order, but it does come from a personal narrative as well from actually my mom's side of the family to continue yeah. this family, this family deep dive into my roots. Um, <laughs> well, it is the deep dive, my what we do. Yeah. My mom's brother was murdered when he was a teenager oh, and it was not by a serial killer. It was by a friend. Mm -hmm. um, but again, how and why and the depth of that really tortured my mom and wow. i think that influenced me to be interested in criminal behavior and ultimately this vault of information was brought to me by a husband and wife named barbara and richie dickstein who had written to criminals some of the biggest notorious serial killers of the 20th century for over a decades wow so they'd acquired what i felt like could be an enduring podcast mm -hmm. not just something sensational and as a producer of it as well we've put together um experts who come in you know fbi agents and mm -hmm. criminal psychologists and other murder really experts and and ask them to sort of reflect on the different psychoses of each of these serial killers and uh when eric roberts was brought up to me i've done two movies with him mm. he an incredible actor he's an incredible person and i think he did a phenomenal job so we're just now waiting to see how the numbers go so hopefully everybody will keep downloading the podcast and if so we have many 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 more serial killers um in the oh, vault yeah. that we want to unfold but we're building that hopefully that momentum to to do a second season yeah, I listened to your John Wayne Gacy one. Really enjoyed that one. I've uh, I've become the same thing. Like just like Law and Order, I've also become with uh, obsessed with serial killers and cults during this whole pandemic time. Uh, working from home and also watching these programs. Did you when you got involved? Did you know about these other the, the obsession that people had with uh, you know Mind Hunter being a a Netflix show that kind of it was a scripted show, but still kind of explored this idea of the serial killer. Were you aware of the obsession about it? And did you did you want to did you endeavor to work really, really hard to kind of make it unique? Uh, this Killer's Vault podcast? Yeah, I think I think that people are fascinated mm -hmm. and to delve into it without just shocking sexuality and sensationalism, which is yeah. all there. But that's what those killers wrote in those letters to Barbara and Richie. Right. So where my interest lies is not exactly in the content, it's in the quality of the content. Right. There's so much of it, it's so based in truth, and if you're interested in the mind of a serial killer, you will get a wealth of information from Killer's Vault. I mm -hmm. mean, there's just years and years of letter writing between these notorious serial killers and this husband and wife. So if you're interested, I actually think at the end of it all, when we're done, if we are we do more than one episode, um, more than one season, yeah. we should travel the vault, you know, from university to university of criminal, criminal 
professional psychology students because it's really a people the criminal mind. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's fascinating, right? We're we're obsessed with it because it's so foreign to us. We try to understand how how people can do the things that they do, how they can remove the human connection to the things that they're doing, even as they're obsessed with their own pain. So it's yeah, it's a fascinating exploration in terms of serial killers. So yeah, um, it's such a stark contrast to your lunch with Liz, lunches with Liz with uh, this that you do on Instagram. Um, what in what what brought that about? Because you do that as well, and it, like I think it's twice weekly. You do yeah. it for about half an hour. You just had the Schreiber grandchildren on, I think, for a Special Olympics discussion, if I remember correctly. So what yeah. what drove that? Was that your need to kind of still like? Touch, be in touch with people inspire these inspire people with these stories no what, no what it's, it's totally evolved we got locked up in march in a pandemic uh right. and i was like oh my god i'm a single mom i live alone with my daughter i'm like and now how does everybody else in the world feel maybe they're <laughs> alone alone maybe they don't have a partner maybe they oh, don't have a child i'm like i'm gonna and every celebrity known to man did it yeah but i did it every single day for three months right I had a friend come on every single day for 30 minutes. We talked, we chatted, it was light, it was loose. And as it became too much to do, I yeah. chose Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And then they evolved even more into awesome people doing awesome things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're light and they're loose, but generally speaking, the common denominator is, I think they're pretty incredible people doing something incredible in the world. And this week we have Doug Buden, who hosts the Jeff Lewis live um, show. Mm. And he's just a good person bringing laughter into the world. And yeah. then I have uh, Shelby Lynn coming on Thursday. What? Who is just a phenomenal singer songwriter. I love so she, Shelby. I know. I love her too. So I just, um, you know, just bring like, I guess much like the respect project, different people, different walks of life different gifts they're bringing out into the world but they're all they're all bright lights oh, all right well elizabeth rome i'm gonna earn my way onto that show one of these days no I'm, in just, fact i was gonna say uh, to you you should be on uh, one of the respect talks and you should come on to the lunch with liz so get my information from danny and email okay. me we'll find a time i would love that i thank you very much wow what an honor thank you so much i love what you're doing so to be a part of it would be great uh i do want to ask you a couple other questions Dolly Polito, American Hustle. Talk to me about that hair. Talk to me about that hair, Elizabeth Rowe. <laughs> this is Robinson, of course. I think that was David O. Yeah. Russell's inspiration was Mrs. Robinson's like black hair with the, the streaks. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? This is fantastic. What a way to, st I mean, you've got a, you got a murderous row of actors, right? Including yourself. So how do you stand out from that? The black streak, it totally worked in some way. It kept you really memorable along with your performance. What's your experience thinking about that film? Oh, I, I mean, David, David O. Russell is a genius. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said you've spoken a number of times about how that Oscar campaign was a whole new experience for you as an actress. Um, what, what was the, what, what is now when you think about it now, is, is there a desire to get back to that? Is there a desire to kind of find your way back to more of that Oscar uh, possible fair? You also did joy as well with Jennifer Lawrence. So, yeah. Um, I don't know that, you know, aiming for the awards is the purpose, but I do think my level of what kind of work I want to do and yeah. the amount of work I want to put into my work was really deeply impacted by being with a five-time Oscar nominated director mm. and those actors who are all multiple nominated yeah. actors. So, you know, just, you know, you're with the A-team and I think it does have a deep impact on your work ethic. And I mean, I was even just watching Wedding Crashers last night <laughs> and, uh, and it was so funny, but I could see in even Bradley then yeah. just how thorough fearless and creative and every detail even though it's a, co a good big comedy yeah. rom-com but yeah i mean I, I i feel like and then watching him direct a star is born and i i just i think being surrounded by people who are fearless who give everything they've got to what they're doing has a deep deep impact on you and i gotta go back to notorious nick and say that about cody christian yeah. i really have to say it he is worthy of that kind of attention, whether he gets it for this movie or something else you will see in the future. I hope I get to direct him. I hope I get to 
uh, be a part of that because he's a fearless talent who puts everything he's got into <clears throat> what he's doing. Um, and yes, I would love it very much if my films that I'm in um, are recognized by the highest uh, echelon of my peers. But um, yeah. but really what meant more than anything was getting the SAG award. Oh yeah. Because when you're an actor, there's no higher um, higher um, award than that. So yeah. yeah. My uh, my friend is the uh, you know I've been a part of the SAG Awards for I'm uh, almost about fifteen years uh, with uh, Jeff Margolis Productions and all the working with them and all the people there. So yeah, I remember you guys winning the SAG Award that year. That was so great. I was just like so happy because I, I enjoyed that so much. Uh, so great to see yeah. that overall. Yeah. And really, I think when it comes down to it, when is direct as far as directing goes, I'm I'm an actor's director, and yeah. uh, and the highest recognition really sh sh you know is felt at something like the SAG Awards as an actor. But I think as a filmmaker, I really am about the actors as well. Without them, mm -hmm. you don't have a film. So right. hopefully right. If, if I continue to make movies, people people respond to, you'll see some great acting to come. All right, real quick. Favorite film ever. Do you have one? Favorite film ever. Oh. Um. <laughs> or, is, or is there a comfort film you go back to every time that kind of re-inspires you? You know, I, I don't I'm not, I don't know if I have a favorite film, but okay. I do love a film called Cinema Paradiso. Oh, now you're talking. Oh, not the director's cut either. Not the, the original cut, right? You're saying the original cut, right? Yeah, because it's about, you know, never forgetting where you're from yes. and love being always at the heart of what you do. Yeah. And the magic of movies. Yeah. Shout out to Toto. Shout out to Toto. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that movie. It's so good. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, listen, I think that's the, a great place to stop. Thank, Elizabeth, thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, it's been awesome uh, talking with you and getting to know you even more. I definitely uh, reach out to Danny uh, for that information and we'll set something up. But I just uh, want to let people know Notorious yeah. Nick, it's out there for on demand on Apple TV. It's coming out August 6th. Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you. And it's also going to be available on DVD August 17th. So you'll be able to get it across the board on all platforms. There you go. An inspirational story. You're struggling with something you people telling you can't achieve a goal. Watch this movie. It will get you into the right frame of mind to achieve that goal. And you get a fantastic perform. You get fantastic performances across the board. Cody Christian, uh, Kevin Pollack, who I love seeing in this role. And of course, the great Elizabeth Rome. All right, this has been the deep cut uh, with the uh, with John Roca here on the Outlaw Nation and the Great Elizabeth Rome. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.